encircled by stormy seas, swept by icy winds, protected by ice fields and the cold, for ages the regions of the far north were isolated from the rest of the world. Except for the Vikings, whalers, and a few rare adventurers, the Arctic was for a long time a mysterious world, a land of myth and legend. It was not until the 20th century that explorers tackled this last frontier. And thanks to the accounts of their exploits, the rest of the world discovered the raw beauty of the polar regions. But before that, many limits and landmarks would have to be surpassed. This magnificent route that we're sailing today will take us to the first of those mythical landmarks, the famous Cape North, on the very northernmost tip of the European continent. Honigsberg, latitude 71 degrees north. This little Norwegian port is exactly 2,100 kilometers from the North Pole. The waters of the Barents Sea are teeming with fish and all year long huge Russian and Norwegian trawlers put in here. In the summer they share the port with the cruise ships, particularly the coastal express liners calling in at Honesvog about 30 kilometers from Cape North. Except for the Laplanders who arrived here at the beginning of the present era, this region was isolated from the rest of the world for ages and ages. Then, around the 10th century, the Vikings settled here. Later, around the 16th century, came the Whalers, first the Basques, then the Dutch. Christopher Columbus's discovery of America and the opening of the route to India by Vasco da Gama inspired many navigators to seek out new routes to the east. And that's when Cape North made its official entry into the history books. It was the urge to push on ever further that drove the Europeans north in search of a maritime route to the east. That would give them access to the riches of the Far East. That's how, in 1553, Richard Chancellor set out from London with three boats and headed for Cape North. He was trying to find the Northeast Passage. Two of the ships sank in the storm, and Richard Chancellor, the captain of the third ship, managed to round North Cape. He was the first known navigator to mark North Cape on a map. Latitude 71 degrees, 10 minutes, 21 seconds north. Here, overlooking the ocean, is the mythical North Cape, now a popular destination for Norwegian tourists. There were a few historic voyages here, like those of Prince Louis Philippe of France and King Oscar II in 1873. But it was, in fact, thanks largely to the Coastal Express, which launched a regular service along the Norwegian coast in 1893, that North Cape has become such a popular site. Tourists are not the only ones to come to North Cape in the summer. There are a few family of Laps, or Samur, that continue to observe the age-old rituals and accompany their herds of reindeer every summer on their annual migration from the interior of the country to the seacoast. Even though they live partly from tourism, Nils and his family are still very attached to their people's traditional way of life. It's difficult to keep the reindeer together, so you have to take advantage of the wind direction and natural barriers. When I have to group them somewhere, I always check the direction of the wind, because reindeer always advance into the wind. I love this way of life, because I'm not tied down to a timetable. 
I never know what I'll be doing from one day to the next. It's the rain and weather that decide how I handle the herd, during the winter, that is. In summer, when we're on the sea coast, I simply keep an eye on the herd to make sure everything is OK. Every summer, Nils sets up a lavo, the traditional tent of the Laplanders, next to his house and little souvenir shop. It's a tourist draw, but it also gives him the opportunity to talk about the Lap's traditional way of life. And yet, Nils is no postcard Lap. Even though he's fairly old, he continues to follow his herds in their annual migrations. There are about 12 of us doing this same type of work. It takes us two weeks in September to round up the herd of 6,000 head of reindeer and take them inland, to the other side of the mountains, near Karashok. The 6,000 reindeer belong to several different owners, but we all work together. I can't let reindeer stray from the herd just because they don't belong to me. I have to bring them back to the herd. So to accompany his reindeer on their migration, Nils makes the long trek to North Cape every year. But sometimes, especially when the icy Arctic wind howls across this barren landscape, he wonders just why the tourists come all this way. North Cape is... North Cape is the summit of Europe, the last frontier, the tip of the continent. It's both an observation post and a boundary. It's very moving for me to find myself here on North Cape and to think, I'm looking towards the north, but I cannot go any further. Everyone who has ever come to North Cape, the navigators of the old days, as well as today's travelers, when they reach the extreme tip of the continent, they all have the feeling not only of having reached the end of a road, but also of having attained a deep personal limit. Morning, we board the Coastal Express and leave Hönigsvog, heading for Tromsø, a day's sailing to the south of North Cape. After Richard Chancellor, there were other navigators who set out in quest of the Northeast Passage to Asia. In 1596, the Dutchman Willem Barents managed to venture even further and reach the Nouvelle Zambla Islands before he was blocked by ice as well. For centuries after Barents' feet, many expeditions set out to the Arctic. But the golden age of polar exploration came later, at the end of the 19th century, and even more so at the beginning of the 20th century. And to relive those glorious years, we're going to head for Tromsø. At the time, Tromsø was the starting point of the polar expeditions, and it still plays that role even today, a century after the exploits of Amundsen and Nansen, the two most famous Norwegian explorers.
Tromsø, the largest town north of the Arctic Circle, is located on an island connected to the mainland by a bridge. It boasts the world's northernmost cathedral, university, and even brewery. From 1850 on, Tromsø expanded and developed. They smartened up the town center, and the arts and culture thrived. The inhabitants followed the latest clothing fashions, and they even opened the first movie house north of the Arctic Circle. Pleasantly surprised to find such an urbane atmosphere so far north in Europe, the early voyagers christened Tromsø the Paris of the North. When Amundsen landed at Tromsø, it was one of the major centers for fishing, whaling, and seal hunting in the Arctic Ocean. Tromsø owes its reputation to its geographic location. We're very close to the northern regions, that is, Spitsbergen and the Arctic Ocean. Plus, the town and its inhabitants have inherited a store of traditional knowledge about navigation on the Arctic Ocean. There used to be a lot of sailors here, men who had first-hand experience sailing in extreme conditions in the cold and ice. When they'd come back from sea, the port would be bustling with excitement, with the heady smell of seal, sea salt and whale. And there also was the smell of the breweries, of malt and beer. The streets, of course, were crowded with people. There'd be children coming to meet their father, their big brothers, uncles or grandfather. Wives would greet their husbands and young lovers would be reunited after a long absence out at sea. Sailors, trappers, ship's carpenters, cooks, hunters, harpooners. All these men that had first-hand experience of the far north would be very useful to Amundsen, Nansen, and all the rest of the Arctic explorers. Trump's Polar Museum relates their adventures. Nansen, and in particular, his voyage on the Fram. On September 20th, 1893, after sailing along the northern coast of Russia all the way to the New Siberian Islands, the Fram became frozen into the ice, which then carried the ship slowly to the west. The ship remained blocked for three years, during which time Nansen carried on his research with Johansen. The two explorers set out for the North Pole on foot. They didn't make it, but they were picked up off the ice pack by another ship one year later. The Fram was finally freed from the ice and made its way back to Tromsø on July 20th, 1896. Today, Tromsø still has a close relationship with the Arctic, not through a nostalgic reminiscence of the old days of Arctic expeditions and seal hunting, but with its sights set on the future.
Oliver Seals are now five years old, but already weigh over 250 kilos. So as you can see, this is a very large seal species. It's actually one of the largest you will find in the find of Norwegian Arctic waters. So when I say Norwegian waters, it's a pure Arctic seal species. It's very important to go to Norway. The city's Arctic connection is not limited to the museum and the attractions for the tourists and children. Tromsø is the headquarters of the Norwegian Polar Institute, which has a research station in Ni Alesund in Spitsbergen. The town is also home to the Institute of Marine Research, a major research center for fishing, which is still one of the mainstays of the local economy. There are still a good number of modern trawlers that call in at this port when they're fishing in the Arctic. In a way, these fishermen are perhaps the last adventurers of the northern seas. Um, my first fishing trip up to the Svalbards was quite an adventure. We didn't really know exactly where to go, so we were searching the sea for new fishing zones. But fishing in winter is pretty rough when it's 24, 25 below zero, when the falling snow lashes at you like needles while you're working, with only two glaring spotlights in the pitch black night. These are very hard and dangerous conditions, and with huge icebergs and drifting ice. So Tromsø is basically a point of departure. For today's fishermen and yesterday's whalers, seal hunters and explorers, the true frontier of adventure has always been much further north, exactly 800 kilometers from Tromsø, in Spitsbergen, the largest of Norway's Svalbard islands. Longarbing. Latitude 78 degrees, 10 minutes north. Although they are situated on the same latitude, the north of Greenland and Canada are blocked by ice even during the Arctic summer. What keeps Spitsbergen clear of ice is the small arms of the Gulf Stream that run along its coast. From the beginning of the 17th century, this climatic singularity attracted whalers, then trappers. Later in the middle of the 19th century, the first scientific expeditions arrived but there was no permanent settlement in Spitsbergen until the end of the 19th century, when they discovered coal deposits. In 1906, an American, John Monroe Longyear, opened a mine here on the spot where there's now a town bearing his name, Longueuil. Most of Longueuil's 2,000 inhabitants work in the public services, commerce, or tourism. Six months of total night, then six months of unending day. That's the rhythm that the inhabitants of Longyearbyen have to adjust to. Even if the summer temperatures are milder, between six and 10 degrees on the average, winter and its snowfalls are never far away. The proof? The number of snowmobiles lined up in front of each house. In just a few weeks, first the boats, then the cars will take up their winter quarters in the garages. Then comes the season of the snowmobiles. The snowmobile is uh, important because uh, it's a quite big island. And uh, to get uh, out of the city in the, in the winter time, you need a snowmobile. You can bring the whole family on the snowmobile if you have uh, have more than one, you can have passenger, you can have uh, wagons with uh, kids in the back. And uh, it's possible to, to explore most of the island with the, with the snowmobile. 
Especially when the light comes back from uh, mid-March when uh, it starts to be light until mid-May when it starts to get warmer again uh, The snowmobiles are used a lot every evening every weekend people go out it leaves uh, 500 snowmobiles from Longyearbyen every day While awaiting the first snowflakes that will cover the town and free the snowmobiles, Longabun, shrouded in mist, looks like some kind of mysterious ghost town. As for us, it's time to get aboard our boat, the Nordsternen, which is getting ready for the last cruise of the season. and set our course west for Barentsburg. Svalbard Islands had long been claimed by Russia, but in 1920 they were attributed to Norway, according to the Treaty of Paris, which also stipulated that all the 42 countries that signed the treaty had the right to exploit the natural resources of the islands. But apart from the Norwegians, the Russians were the only ones to establish mining towns. And of Spitsbergen's three Russian communities, only one is still active, Barentsburg. The Soviets came to Barentsburg in 1932. Until then, the mine, which is in the center of town, about 500 meters underground, was run by the Dutch. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Barentsburg, in order to survive, has to become economically viable. And it has a lot of handicaps to overcome. First of all, it's isolation. The town is supplied only twice a year by a ship from Murmansk. Then there's the rundown state of the industrial equipment. In 1997, an accident took the lives of 23 miners. Barentsburg does have its share of tourists who come for the 1950s Soviet atmosphere but otherwise the town attracts fewer and fewer workers. Even if salaries are higher than in the Ukraine, where most of the miners come from, there are no more than 500 now, compared to 1,500 just a few years ago. Thank you. 
есть я работаю 6 часов. I work six hour shifts. One week from 6 a.m. to noon. And the week after from noon to 6 p.m. Ну, в общем, чередуется постоянно. Ну, I'm not worried, but I'm prudent. It makes me so happy to think that in 10 days I'll be going home and my work down in the mine will be over. My parents live here, so I was brought up here with them. Then I got married, but I think they were going to be leaving. leaving Barentsburg. This time, the Nordsternen sets its course north in the direction of Ni Alesund. After a few hours at sea, we enter into the Konigsfjord. At the far end of the fjord is the Ni Alisund Research Station. Latitude 78 degrees 50 minutes north. Ni Alisund is the world's northernmost community. Ni Alisund started out basically as a mining town, but in 1962 the mine was closed following a serious accident that took 21 lives. And two years later, a major international research center was opened here. Carl, an optical engineer, is one of the 35 researchers that live here year-round. I wouldn't say uh, it's an adventure to be here, but it's uh, a challenge, maybe. You wonder what it's like. You seek the unknown, maybe, I don't know. Like most Norwegians, uh, the, some of my heroes when I was a small boy was, you know, the Arctic adventurers and... Uh, most Norwegians have been uh, quite heavily fed on the, the Norwegian polar heroes. <laughs> and of his heroes, Roald Amundsen was one of the most admired. On board the dirigible Norga, he took off from Ni Alisund on May 11, 1926. After a 16-hour crossing, he reached the North Pole. He then continued on to land in Alaska. The Norga flew over regions of the Arctic that were previously unexplored, 
and allowed Amundsen to state for certain that there was no land around the North Pole. The last unknown region of the globe had finally yielded up its secrets. The little mining train is now a museum piece. In its own way, it embodies the changes that have taken place in just a few decades. In the 1960s, the atmosphere of Ni Alasund was polluted. Now the purity of the air is a valuable asset for the scientists. Uh, the main activities here in Ni Alasund is science. Um, here we have the ability to find out what the atmosphere is like uh, when it's not uh, exposed to any human activity. There is no factories and uh, there is no traffic in the immediate vicinity. You have to travel for thousands of miles to reach the nearest uh, big road. It, this is a very uh, international community. Altogether, uh, we're closing in on 20 nations working here on and off. So uh, that's very... Uh, it's a very uh, stimulating environment to working and you meet a lot of uh, interesting people and sometimes a bit crazy people, but nevertheless interesting. The Arctic sky can change very quickly, and the sea turns choppy as we approach Smerenberg Fjord. For safety's sake, the captain sends two Zodiac boats ahead to the beach where the passengers are to disembark. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now tried to make a landing, but because of the wind condition and Nordstjern are not very stable at the anchor, and there's also too much waves on the gangway and on the shore, so therefore we have to abort this landing. And we just have to discuss it a bit here up on the bridge, and then we will come back with more information very soon. Today we can uh, go almost everywhere, but for, for this ship we cannot go into the ice, so of course we also have to consider the, the, the ice and the movement of the ice on the northern side. And this summer it will be a lot of ice, but we have a lot of nice places, uh, the whole, so it's not, no problem to find a nice spot, even if we have to cancel one spot, we, can, we have a lot of other places to go, so that's no problem. Captain keeps his promise, and in less than an hour we arrive in the Kosfjord. The surface of the water is covered in drifting ice.
Straight ahead, we can see the Liliuk Glacier emerging from the surrounding mist. ice you see on the sea uh, right now it's a calf that's calved from the glacier you can actually hear some of the uh, noise from this uh, glacier because of the weather condition we have now makes it more active and it uh, large pieces will fall off the, the glacier wall and um, spread out uh, on the fjord Spitsberg and 60% uh, of the land are covered by a uh, glacier and this is a part, just a part of a bigger glacier that cover a large piece of Spitsberg and because you have this uh, big piece of ice cap and this is just a small arm of the or a tongue of this uh, ice cap makes this uh, glacier into this the fjord. I have been here for the past four years and I can on, only for this uh, few years I can see uh, large differences uh, of the glacier fronts. So you can actually see from year to year that uh, the front is moving back. But also if you want to see, um, look at the glaciers, you also have to see how it's growing in the back, not just only look at the front. But sadly uh, uh, most of the glaciers are retreating. After our fascinating ride through the drift ice of Liliuk, we reached the Molefjord. This harsh region used to be the heart of the trappers' hunting grounds. Finstadt hasn't been back to this region since the 1960s. Yeah. Back then, he left his wife and child behind to become a trapper. He went to Greenland first, then spent an entire year in Spitsbergen alone, hunting bear and fox.
In those days, he lived in a wooden cabin just like the one built in Camp Zoe in 1911 by the most famous trapper of all, Henry Rudy. When I was little, I would read stories about trappers and explorers, like Nansen and Amundsen, stories that took place in Greenland or Spitsbergen. And those stories gave me a taste for adventure. I came here looking for adventure. Spitsbergen at the beginning of the 20th century was still a land of adventure for trappers, a land where there were no limits to the number of walrus, seals, and Arctic foxes they could kill. It's said that Henry Rudy, nicknamed the Polar Bear King, killed some 713 polar bears between 1911 and 1947 when he retired. Finstadt recalls most vividly is not the number of bears or foxes he bagged, but the extreme climatic conditions and the hazards of the drifting ice. I remember once we were in the eastern part of Svalbard and we had set our tent up on the Agabukta Bay. It was frozen over. We were about three kilometers from dry land. One night, right after we had fallen asleep, there was a strange noise that woke us up. It was the tent flapping in the wind. We looked out and realized that we had drifted out to sea. The ice we were on had broken away. We panicked. We rushed and put on our boots. We didn't even take the time to put on our socks. We took down the tent really quickly and tied it around ourselves. Then, by pushing on floating blocks of ice, we managed to make it back to shore. Times have changed and attitudes as well. The trappers who earned their living from selling furs have now given way to environmentalists. Spitsbergen's Arctic foxes can now roam freely, for they have nothing to fear. is approaching its high point, 80 degrees north latitude. But before we attain that mythical boundary of 80 degrees north latitude, the threshold to the North Pole, Spitsbergen treats us to the dazzling spectacle of these gigantic glaciers blending into the sea.
all over. Now we are on uh, 80 degrees and 03 minutes north and we will uh, keep heading a little bit north uh, along the ice edge to look for wildlife and look on the ice. The site is impressive beyond our expectations. Just as we cross the mythical line of 80 degrees north latitude, we come upon the ice flow. Beyond this vast expanse of white that stretches in waves all the way to the horizon, there is nothing, nothing except the imaginary point that stirred the blood of so many explorers and adventurers, the North Pole. Passengers gather in the stern of the boat to celebrate the high point of their trip. After the flood of exhilaration of having reached such an extreme point, there remains the very real question of the future of the Arctic. There's no comparison between the ice of today that we discovered on this cruise and the ice that blocked Nansen's ship, the Fram, less than a century ago. It used to be thick and robust. Now, it's thin and fragile and in danger of disappearing. The adventurers of the far north took several centuries to blaze the routes that cross the Arctic and lead to the North Pole. Now their descendants have inherited the monumental task of making sure they don't disappear. <laughs> 